Hi there, and welcome back to Oof! Right in the Childhood. I'm Jen, and this is a podcast where I watch the Disney animated feature films in the order in which they were released, and both tell you the history and react to them from a modern standpoint. This time we'll be talking about the fourth Disney movie, 1941's Dumbo, the saddest circus movie ever made. Dumbo is based on a children's book by Helen Averson Meyer and Harold Pearl. Walt first saw the book in 1939 and had intended to make it a short, but he realized really quickly that he needed to make it a full movie. The nice thing about Dumbo is that it didn't need the special effects that Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi did. And after two films that didn't turn a profit in a row, Disney really needed a win. The aim of the animators of Dumbo was to make the film as inexpensively as possible. That's why there are some very worrying, simplistic elements to this movie that we're going to definitely talk about in the summary slash reaction part. Regardless, Disney wanted to get the elephants right, so they brought some into the studio so that the animators could see how they moved. The animators were asked to use watercolors for the film's backgrounds rather than the oil and gouache that other movies had used. Walt was in such a hurry to finish the movie that he rushed the crew and insisted on bringing in a younger, less experienced animators that didn't earn as much pay, and then asked the more senior animators to supervise them without extra pay. With animators working six days a week under grueling conditions, something was bound to give. In May of 1941, Walt arrived at the studio to find that over 200 of his animators had walked out. They had formed a picket line at the gates of the studio with signs demanding fair pay for workers. Walt was furious. He felt betrayed by the new union leader who had been one of the studio's lead animators. The strike lasted nine weeks, leaving Walt Disney Productions with fewer than 600 animators to continue working on both Dumbo and Bambi. Walt refused to negotiate until the National Labor Relations Board stepped in and forced him to create a contract with the union. However, Walt never truly forgave the union for the strike. He created caricatures of them in Dumbo as clowns demanding a raise from the ringmaster. But the thing is, the Disney animator strike didn't just affect Disney. It began a chain reaction with the animators from all the major studios calling for better wages and better hours. Animation World Network says it changed the landscape of animation and comics permanently. In the end, Dumbo cost the studio $950,000. That's $16.6 million nowadays. It was released at 64 minutes long, a length that RKO felt was too short, which is ironic after how they acted about Fantasia being so long. Walt explained that under no circumstances would he make it longer. There wasn't enough story, and he didn't have the money. Eventually, they agreed to release it at that length, and Walt got the miracle he needed. Dumbo quickly became the highest-earning Disney film of the decade. After its first release, it earned $1.3 million, or $22.8 million today. And critics loved Dumbo. They enjoyed the film's colors and animals, and one critic named Cecilia Ager called it, quote, the nicest, kindest Disney yet. I've watched this movie... And I wonder if Cecilia and I saw the same one. This podcast is sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. I love creating content for you, and becoming a patron on my Patreon helps me cover hosting fees and upgrade the equipment I use while allowing me to minimize ad time. At the $5 level, you not only get an ad-free version of each episode a day earlier than it's released, but starting next month, you get a special bonus episode on the first of each month with content available exclusively on Patreon. In October, I investigate the role of Walt Disney Productions during World War II, from the occupation of the studio by the U.S. military to the hundreds of hours of training and propaganda that the studio released. I also provide synopses and commentary for the cartoon portions of eight of the propaganda pieces they released during the war. Information for my Patreon can be found on my website at oofmychildhood.com. Before I get into the reactions to this movie, I'm going to give you a big old trigger warning. For what? Like, everything. This movie has racism, animal abuse, ableism, more animal abuse, patriarchy, and even more animal abuse. I've been watching all of these on Disney+, Plus, not sponsored, 
which has been traditionally very quiet. Netflix, also not sponsored. Netflix, also not sponsored, is fine at level 20 volume, while we usually have Disney Plus at 30 to 35 on our TV. The opening for Dumbo, though, is very loud. I was practically knocked off the couch. The movie starts out with synchronized stork flying over Florida. The stork myth has always fascinated me. The idea that people just woke up one morning and a baby had appeared without any notice. The storks bring babies to all the animals in the circus, except for Mrs. Jumbo the elephant. As someone who's been in fertility treatments for several years, I especially feel her pain in this scene. We zoom out to another stork who has lost his baby. Seen from the clouds, the United States is neatly separated into states with clear labels. We saw before that if your baby arrives at night, it just shows up. If it comes during the day, however, a giant bird shows up in front of your friends, makes you sign for it, and then sings happy birthday to it. This seems like the equivalent of giving birth in public. This little tiny elephant rolls out of the stork's bindle, and he is the cutest thing ever. And then, as soon as everyone starts cooing over him, his ears pop out, and they're as big as his whole body. The other lady elephants proceed to insult this adorable baby and then say Mrs. Jumbo has a nasty temper when she tells them to cut that crap out. Sounds about right. Now for the first racist song of the film. Hey, I'd completely forgotten about black workers talking about how they're thrilled they never learned to read or write. And then we watch the elephants be forced to help set up too. Oof, right in the childhood. This was an anti-circus movie, right? They have a really cool circus parade to launch the circus. I can see in it some inspiration for Aladdin's parade, but with more clown violence. Dumbo gets distracted by the crowd and trips on his ears into the mud. My favorite animal podcast, Just the Zoo of Us, talked about how sometimes animation shows elephants drinking through their trunks. I appreciate how in the bath scene, both Mrs. Jumbo and Dumbo suck the water up and then release it from their trunks like they would in the real world. I would also like to take this moment to note that neither of the main elephants have their own name. Dumbo's father, whom we never meet, is Jumbo. Dumbo's mother intended to name him Jumbo Jr. until everyone decided that him having big ears made him less attractive and started calling him Dumbo. So his mother goes by her mate's name and he has an ableist name that isn't real. It was during this scene that I realized that they're also the only elephants who don't talk. That's an interesting realization. But there's this beautiful mother-child moment where they play together and just love each other. The circus opens and almost immediately some jerk little kid with big ears starts making fun of Dumbo. This is ironic and shows how disdainful humans are. Mrs. Jumbo tries to move him away, but they drag him out and start to pull on him. So like any mother, she decides to defend her baby. This involves her spanking that little boy, but it was the 1940s. That was done all the time. Nevertheless, the circus workers get really upset. They whip her and lock her away. All humans are terrible. It's also at this point that you should take a moment to realize that they drew all of the people of color without faces. Danger, mad elephant, my Aunt Fanny. So they've separated a mother elephant from her calf within what we assume is days of his birth. According to Elephants for Africa, an elephant research group, Elephant calves continue to drink milk from their mothers for up to 10 years. They aren't just separating a mother from her child, they're starving that child. The other bitty elephants are making fun of the humans that Mrs. Jumbo fought back against, but oh, she must remember that she's a lady. Ugh, someone tell these hellions that cinnamon rolls are better than gender rolls. One of them says she doesn't blame Mrs. Jumbo, and another says, yeah, it's totally the baby's fault for being born with large ears. How dare he? Timothy Mouse overhears this, and he's like, he looks like to me. They shut Dumbo out from the hay, which, oh, by the way, he shouldn't be eating anyway, but someone took his mother from him. So he's definitely going to starve now. Timothy decides he's going to scare the elephants. I think Mythbusters did an episode that elephants are actually startled by mice, so that's a fun fact. Side note, where did Timothy get his little band uniform? I want that story. There's an adorable scene where Timothy makes friends with Dumbo using peanuts. Do elephants eat peanuts? According to the Smithsonian, no. No, they do not. When the peanut doesn't work, Timothy offers to break out Mrs. Jumbo. They're friends now! The circus's ringmaster is seen silhouetted in his tent. 
He's yelling at someone named Joe about this new elephant attraction that sounds hella dangerous, and all the while he's stripping out of his clothes, and Joe keeps getting closer. Finally, he yells, and then comes the climax! And it is at this moment that I have to remember that I'm older than 12, because I laugh. Dumbo, you're a climax. Okay. Timothy starts his speech. I am the voice of your subconscious mind, which is not a thing that a subconscious mind would say. Also, there are many more references to climaxes. I also want to bring up that either Timothy speaks human or all the animals speak human. In these movies, I've always assumed that the animals speak to one another, but humans would just hear the same sounds we do. They do this massively dangerous stunt with the animals, which seems to be done for the first time ever in front of a crowd. Why would you not practice this? Also, these lady elephants are terrible to each other. It feels like a special kind of sexism or patriarchal construct of how women act. Timothy didn't think to practice with Dumbo either. So, there is one elephant on a ball with six elephants on top of her. Let's do some math. According to the Denver Zoo and Elephants for Africa, Female elephants weigh between 6 and 9,000 pounds, or 1,800 to 4,000 kilograms. Asian elephants are generally smaller than African, but it seems that the cows have the same weight range. So let's assume that all these ladies are average elephants of non-specific genus. We now have a ball holding 52,500 pounds of pachyderm, or 23,800 kilos, and 45,000 pounds, or 20,400 kilograms, is on the back of one of those elephants. One kind planet says that elephants can easily carry up to 9,000 pounds or 4,000 kilos each. This, this is not safe. Dumbo is scared because of course he is and it's a miracle no one got seriously injured or died. It seems that the worst of it is that the tent is destroyed. So we moved watching the train chugging away in a sad fashion. The elephants are hurt, but again, they should have died, and what they want is to spank him, but instead of realizing that this is a baby who maybe needs his mom and a little more humane treatment, they've made him a clown. There's this whole thing of the lady saying that he can no longer be an elephant if he's a clown. What jerks. They put an infant elephant who is in an actual burning house with the clowns messing around to, quote, save him, and I, an adult human, would be terrified of this situation. Him's a baby. How could he understand? Afterward, the clowns drink to Dumbo. At least someone likes him. Timothy tries so hard to cheer him up. He's doing his best. And here is the most beautiful, saddest song ever. Baby Mine shows animals throughout the circus with their babies, but the more I watch, the more I believe this has to be anti-circus. Look at the hippos in a tiny bathtub and Mrs. Jumbo in chains in a cart too small for her. It just cannot be pro-circus. Back to the clowns, planning to put Dumbo into more danger. There's precisely one clown who is afraid of this, but the others think elephants is made of rubber. They sing, we're gonna hit the big boss for a raise. Remember that animator strike? Meanwhile, adorable baby elephant hiccups are about to not be cured by alcohol-laced water. In Pinocchio, we said jackass. In this G-rated movie, we have a juvenile elephant and a mouse of unknown age drunk. Best children's movies ever. Alcohol allows you to magically blow bubbles that are alive and self-replicating. Everybody get drunk! Remember how I said Fantasia was Disney's first acid trip? Well, someone dropped acid during the pink elephants on parade scene. Prove me wrong. I need a psychiatrist to write a dissertation on pink elephants on parade. I can't break this down. If you're a psychological expert and would like to have a conversation about this scene, let me know. We'll do a bonus episode on just this. So Timothy and Dumbo get super drunk and wake up on top of a tree. We've all been there, right? And the crows appear! Here's the thing. There's a lot of discourse on whether the crow is a racist depiction, and most of it's fair on both sides. First of all, the head crow is named Jim Crow. You know, the laws that constitutionally mandated segregation and suppressed the voting rights of black people in America. And he's voiced by Cliff Edwards, the same person who voiced Jiminy Cricket. And in case you don't want to look it up, Cliff is white. So, 
we have a white man mimicking the vocal stylings of a black man as a character named Jim Crow. That's pretty danged racist. But also, the Crows are like the only characters apart from Timothy who love and respect Dumbo immediately. They think he's awesome and give him the confidence that he needs to find his true worth. Which, as an aside, is that he's an awesome pachyderm, not that he can fly. And a lot of people of color like Whoopi Goldberg say they wish the crows were more merchandised because they showed loving and caring to Dumbo when white people slash elephants only treated him with harm. So the question is, can a character be both good and wholesome and an offensive racist stereotype? Yes, yes it can. Okay, back to the movie. Timothy says, why didn't I think that you could fly before? Because he's an elephant, Timothy, and that's not the logical conclusion. The crows then have the best song of the movie. Timothy then defends Dumbo by calling him an orphan. He's not an orphan. His mother's in prison and he has an absentee father. That's not what an orphan is, but it is a beautiful speech. So Timothy decides that Dumbo's going to learn to fly by jumping off a cliff. He marches him off of what appears to be Pride Rock, and then he tries to fly for the first time. And he does! So, they return to the circus where he is returned to the burning building. He jumps off of the burning building and then discovers that he's lost his magic feather. It's then that Timothy tells him that he doesn't need the feather to fly. He proceeds to fly. Everyone loves him. The circus is a happy place. Timothy gets a movie contract? Mrs. Jumbo gets a private train, and the end. Disney just stopped there. This, this is not a good movie. It's when I read the reviews that call this nice and kind that I just wonder if the 1940s actually took place in a parallel universe where animal cruelty was fun and spunky. Well, at least that's my opinion. But you know whose opinion really matters? Yours, dear listener. I'd love to know about your memories and current opinions of Dumbo. So if you'd like to tell me how this movie was part of your childhood, or even how you see it today, come talk to me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can find me under the show's name or the handle Oof My Childhood. This episode's cover art was provided by Shasha. You can find more of her art on Instagram. I link to it in the show's notes and on my website at oofmychildhood.com. If you'd like to provide cover art for a future episode, head over to the website. We have a form to submit your art, as well as the details for what the requirements are. Just click Submit Your Art to have your piece considered for a future episode. Our theme music was composed and played by Sean Rudolph of Let Music Be. For more information on that studio, you can visit their website at letmusic.be or visit my website for an easy link. You can find transcripts for each episode on my website, and if you check out my YouTube channel, I have captioned video versions of each episode as they're published. I do my best to provide YouTube videos and transcripts at the same time as each podcast episode is released, but if this one isn't up yet, you can always check on my website for an update and a link to the appropriate video. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you come back each week to discuss Disney through modern eyes. And while you're at it, if you're enjoying yourself, please let your friends know about me. I'd also appreciate a rating and review wherever you're listening to the show. This podcast is written, recorded, and edited by me. I release a new episode every Monday through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many other podcatchers. So until next time, keep the magic alive!